So we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to our Shelter Series event. My name is Clarissa Goodlett and I'm the Communications Director at Preservation North Carolina. And so during this time when sheltering um, continues to be a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space where we can connect with you and explore the culture, architecture, diversities, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. Um, this is one of several of our shelter series events um, scheduled for this year. And so registration is open for our upcoming events at preservationnc.org. Uh, and so this afternoon, we are very excited to present Black Landscapes Matter presented by uh, NC State Professor Kofi Boone and it's sponsored by Blue Heron Asset Management. Um, Kofi Boone is a professor of landscape architecture and environmental design at NC State University, where his work focuses on the changing nature of communities and developing tools for enhanced community engagement and design. Through scholarship, teaching, and extension service, Professor Boone works in the landscape context of environmental justice, and his research includes the use of new media as a means of increasing community output in design and planning processes. Professor Boone is a recipient of several awards, including the Opal Mann Green Engagement Scholarship Award, the Department Landscape Architecture Professor of the Year, and the Alumni Association Outstanding Teacher. Prior to joining the faculty at NC State University, Kofi was a studio leader at JJR, working on a whole range of inter interdisciplinary urban design and planning projects. He received his Master's of Landscape Architecture and Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Michigan. And before I turn it over to Professor Boone, I just wanted to go over quickly some um, webinar FYIs and kind of let you guys know how you'll be able to um, answer questions and then also share some information about our little uh, after party uh, after our webinar. So I'm going to share my screen quickly here. Let's see here. All right. So can you, okay. Can you all see the, this webinar FYM? Okay, great. So as you all can tell, um, everyone is muted and your video is disabled except for our panelists. So we can't hear or see you, but we know you're there and we wanna thank you all for coming. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we're also live streaming it on Facebook right now. Um, and we'll have the recording available um, on our digital channels or on our website at um, preservationnc.org um, and on our YouTube channel. If you're having any problems with, you know, hearing us or, or anything like that or seeing the screen, if you guys will utilize the chat function, and we'll do our best to assist you. Um, if there's somebody um, in the audience who knows how to, to fix whatever the issue is, please um, go ahead and answer that question. We love to have, um, you know, folks participate with that. Um, and so uh, Professor Boone will do his presentation and then we'll open it up for um, a Q&A at the end. Uh, there are a few ways that um, you all can ask questions and I will moderate those questions from our attendees. Um, and so you can go ahead and ask your question at the, at the Q&A. So down at the bottom, um, that black bar that you guys see at the bottom is what you should have on your screen as, as uh, attendees. So you can click on that Q&A button and then type in your question. You can do that anonymously or use your name. If you put your name in there, I'll, I'll say who asked the question. Um, you can also raise your hand and um, then I will call on those folks and I can unmute you and you can ask your question live. Um, but if you wait till the Q&A part to, before raising your hand. Um, and then you can put stuff in the chat as well. Um, I'm trying to kind of moderate three places. So ideally you would either type it in the Q&A or raise your hand and I can handle that, but the, the chat is, is fine, okay. It uh, works okay as well. Um, and then we also have a survey 
way that's going to pop up right when you exit the webinar. If you all would take a, just a few minutes, it's a really short um, survey just to kind of get your feedback on what's working well, what we could be um, improving on. We're probably about, you know, halfway, halfway through the series um, so far. So we're learning a lot, but we're certainly interested in, in your feedback. And then if you have ideas about other topics that you all would like to hear, we, we definitely want to know about that as well. And um, because we know that, you know, uh, socializing is important for everybody's kind of mental health, um, we'd love to, to kind of connect with you and chat with you um, in a little Zoom after party that we were doing after our webinars. So there is a link to that. So when you get off of here, you'll close out. Um, we'll leave here just like a regular after party. You leave the party and go somewhere else. And I'll also post the link to that um that meeting in the the chat so it'll be available there as well um and that is all that i have and now i'm going to turn it over to professor boone thank you thank you for the introduction and thank you everybody for the the welcome uh it's great to be with you all today and uh, uh, looking forward to getting into the talk and learning more about how we can take advantage of the moment. There's a lot of downsides to what we're facing right now, but there are also opportunities. So I'm um, hoping to focus on that. So I will share my screen now and I will set my timer because I'm a professor and I get paid by the word and I don't want to waste your time uh, and we will begin. So again, uh, my name is Kofi Boone. I teach landscape architecture at NC State University. Uh, this is a lecture that I've given in several other places, but it's been modified to uh, suit your organization's needs and it's called Black Landscapes Matter. Uh, the theme came from a symposium that was held at Berkeley uh, in California that was called uh, by Walter Hood, uh, a distinguished landscape architect there. Uh, as well as a North Carolina native uh, who was asking a lot of questions several years ago with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, about the role of design planning in our shared built environmental legacy. And so that was his call. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm from Michigan. I'm a Detroit native. And so my uh, uh, journey to the South and to uh, our context uh, initially was through other medium, like pictures and music and other things before I got here. And you know, one of my favorite photographers was Gordon Parks. And so as a part of his uh, work, this is in Alabama, uh, uh, he captured uh, life in many Southern cities at the time. And I was always struck by this picture uh, before I moved down here of, you know, a lady and, and her daughter, you know, elegantly dressed, you know, in a everyday landscape, uh, looking to be, you know, civilized and, and together. And then you see the rest of the picture and it reveals uh, some of the challenges that it means, uh, the legacy of race, of racism, of white supremacy, and how it affects not just us at the individual level, but the built environmental level. Uh, and I was always struck with the grace and dignity of this picture, that in the face of uh, these oppressive uh, Jim Crow era conditions, that people still found a way to uh, present themselves as full human beings in the face of that. And so when we're faced with uh, our children's generation uh, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder activating uh, not just nationally but globally uh, and we're left scratching our heads thinking that you know a lot of the changes that have happened since the more overt ways that white supremacy and racism affected our lives we thought we dealt with a lot of that stuff and we're ready to move forward that a lot of that is still undergirding uh, how we live our lives uh, the uh, dramatic uh, imagery of uh, confrontations with the police and really open challenges to the state of mass incarceration. Uh, and for our particular audience, people interested in preservation, uh, the targets of protest, uh, particularly in the Southeast, this is in Richmond, uh, Virginia. Uh, this is the Robert E. Lee Memorial, which uh, if it hasn't come down already, it will be coming down very soon. Uh, that the way that we tell our stories in the built environment uh, in some ways have uh, promoted fictions. You know, they have uh, at minimum created barriers of understanding with communities that didn't share the same historical experience as the people that were canonized. And so I don't think it's any 
a coincidence that objects like Confederate monuments and other uh, elements that we have preserved and enshrined uh, even here in North Carolina uh, are the targets of a lot of uh, vitriol and hate and uh, defacing because we're really faced with that moment now. How do we want to remember ourselves and what role does the built environment play in that conversation? And in real time, uh, a lot of controversy in public spaces. I teach landscape architecture, so you won't hear a lot about buildings in my talk, uh, but you will hear about public spaces and streets and parks and all these other places. And fascinating that the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, mural uh, in the plaza that was formed in Washington, D.C. has been not only the target of defacement, but also with another version of history. So you see these layers of history almost as palimpsest forming of people who formed overlapping, overlaying, confrontational narratives, counter narratives, anti-narratives happening in real time around us. You know, I'm struck by this one that's in New York City. This is uh, one that's in lower Manhattan and in some ways represents uh, partnerships that we'd like to explore, not just in the design world, but elsewhere, which is uh, this resulted from partnerships between government and philanthropy and private industry and motivated individuals, uh, the process by which the artists were selected, the materials, the installation, the maintenance were all uh, collaborative and collective and sort of mirrored uh, the kind of relationships that we want to have in the rest of our lives. And that's one thing I do talk about with our students is that, you know, in a genuinely engaged positive design and planning process with communities. For some people, that's the first time that people have been asked what they like, what they don't, have been asked to share stories about the impacts of the world around them on their daily lives, have from the ground up participated in solution strategies, and have seen things executed that are attempts to deal with some of their issues. So I place design and planning in a very important category in the community conversation. And the approach to this particular mural reflects that and is one of the reasons why it's been resistant to vandalism and other things uh, moving forward. Uh, in North Carolina's history, we don't need to go very far to find people who didn't just want to think about it in a temporary and ephemeral way, but in a permanent way. Uh, so uh, Phil Freeline, who passed away uh, in the past year, the prominent uh, architect and architect of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History, uh, illustrates uh, sort of the value of uh, thinking about multiple ways of telling our stories and validated by the overwhelming popularity of this museum. This is from a visit that I made there uh, in, uh, right before uh, COVID shut everything down and the line around the building, this was a Sunday, uh, was three hours long. So there's a, a thirst and a demand and an interest in other ways of using the built environment to tell our cultural stories. And even in uh, not recent history, but history within the memory of some of us are still with us, uh, you know, when we're asked with why are there so few Phil Freelons, you know, why are there so few black folks and African Americans and folks from other ethnic groups participating actively in the built environment if it's so important. Uh, recent surveys suggest that two to four percent of licensed architects, landscape architects, engineers and urban planners are black, uh, still an overwhelmingly uh, white field, as well as in the classroom, so faculty and students. Uh, then part of it is in some ways that we have not done a service uh, to communities to communicate their connection to the built environment, the legacies that are there. So in this picture uh, in the center, Booker T. Washington, uh, immediately uh, to his left, Robert Taylor, uh, standing in the corner, George Washington Carver. Robert Taylor, the first uh, African-American or black architect to graduate from a predominantly white institution, MIT, uh, whom Booker T. Washington personally handpicked to be the architect of Tuskegee Institute, then now Tuskegee University in Alabama. Uh, and Robert Taylor, who saw, not unlike Thomas Jefferson, uh, that the campus and its construction and its uh, uh, development was an opportunity to teach citizenship and to teach self-reliance and to teach leadership. And so Tuskegee Institute in its early days, uh, students would go to class for half the week. And the other half of the week, they were making bricks, they were making glass, they were building foundations to buildings. They actually built and raised the initial Tuskegee Institute, which stands today. 
So there are all of these stories of how uh, Black folks and African Americans were engaged in the landscape. A critique that I have of my profession, landscape architecture, is that they're relegated to the margins. Those stories aren't central to how we tell our full story of how we have uh, transformed the environment over time. Uh, but more broadly, when we deal with preservation, it's another, another story altogether. Another spinoff of uh, Booker T. Washington's work was his partnership with Julius Rosenwald, uh, who uh, was appalled by the disparity in school facilities uh, between Black people and white people in the early 20th century and established a Rosenwald Fund, uh, which funded the development of thousands of schools across the American South that at the time were state-of-the-art in terms of arch architecture, so natural daylight, natural ventilation, uh, elevation above low areas were largely built from local materials. All the things we celebrate now in terms of uh, responsible building uh, was occurring a century ago. In the case of the Rosenwald Fund, he required a match. So local communities, black communities were asked to uh, contribute a certain portion of the cost and then uh, he would provide the other as well as the template uh, for building these schools. Uh, in the case of a place that uh, in North Carolina uh, is the largest uh, collection of Rosenwald schools in the South. Uh, so there is a built environmental legacy that if connected uh, to communities could communicate agency and a legacy of belonging. Princeville, which I'll talk about a bit uh, later in the talk, uh, the oldest uh, free charter black town founded by African Americans, uh, Freedom Hill in 1865, Princeville in 1885, that's a Rosenwald school uh, that is now being used as their museum and welcome center, which is under renovations due to numerous floods. So there's, there are elements that we don't talk about in our mainstream story of preservation, of memory, of the built environment that communicates a level of agency uh, for Black folks and communities who are in a position now of questioning, uh, you know, how to proceed and how to move forward. And I think we all play an extremely important role to play. Uh, concurrent to a lot of these more positive stories are challenges. Uh, and so where I spend a lot of time uh, professionally and academically is in South Park uh, in Southeast Raleigh. Uh, and this was an article, uh, Emily Badger's work, uh, comparing gentrification in black communities. Uh, and so it turns out that the South Park community nationally had one of the highest rates of gentrification in the country. Uh, and people were speculating as to why. Uh, but uh, uh, it communicates a broader uh, narrative and a broader challenge that uh, not everyone welcomes investment, not everyone welcomes reinvestment, not everyone welcomes even well-meaning, well-intentioned uh, folks like us who want to uh, improve uh, buildings, introduce uh, uh, other ways of amplifying history. Sometimes we're seen as a threat. Uh, sometimes we're seen as a, a contributor to larger market forces that can eventually displace people. And so uh, one of the first stops on this conversation is dealing with the idea of placekeeping and resistance to displacement. One of the biggest barriers I've experienced in working with communities in terms of uh, addressing some of the issues that this organization is charged with and others. Placekeeping instead of placemaking. Uh, placemaking uh, is a very common term, a popular term, but has a connotation to some communities that there's no place uh, there, uh, that people who come with resources or come with new ideas or new neighbors uh, have some uh, authorship in terms of defining the characteristics of that particular place, rather than uh, identifying and amplifying the characteristics that are already there. And so placekeeping emerged as a counter movement to placemaking. Uh, so that gives a little background to that term. Uh, some people are shocked by how segregated uh, the United States is today. So this is from 2010. This is a racial dot map, which is not uh, empirically accurate, but shows trends. Uh, the green dots are uh, black folks, uh, African-Americans, you can see still con concentrated in the black belt uh, and in the Southeast United States. Uh, we have the same level of racial segregation between black and white as we did in the 1960s. So despite growth, despite the mixing that we see on a day-to-day -day basis in some workplaces and other places, uh, we still are a segregated country. And uh, in addition to slavery, uh, black communities have grappled with uh, the idea of land loss for a long period of time. Uh, so this is an article I co-authored with Julian Edgeman from Tufts University uh, examining that and then also elevating the idea of commons 
cooperatives, collective ownership, land trusts as alternatives for people with uh, low resources to come together and deal with land. But in summation, 98% of the land that was once owned by African Americans uh, since emancipation uh, is no longer owned by African Americans. They only own 2% of the land that was once owned then. Um, and so there's a notion of uh, early on uh, of displacement. Uh, more broadly, uh, scholars like Mindy uh, Fulov Thompson, uh, she wrote a book called Root Shock, which talks about the psychological impacts of losing your home place. And it was based around research that she was doing in New York City and in Pittsburgh, uh, in New York City with the South Bronx and uh, with uh, freeway construction and urban renewal and slum clearance uh, that devastated that part of New York City. Uh, the lasting psychological impact it had on a number of people, uh, as well as the Hill District, uh, the home of August Wilson, the great playwright in Pittsburgh, uh, that went through a similar process. Uh, but she recounts uh, sort of these shocks to the system, uh, what she calls serial displacement that starts from slavery, moves through uh, Jim Crow and into more contemporary issues like gentrification. And so every generation almost uh, is another major shock to the ability for black communities to hold on and build wealth and build connection to the places that matter. Uh, I lived in Durham for 15 years. Uh, that's where I lived when I first moved here. And I lived in uh, Old East Durham, which on this map is a red line area. Uh, red line maps, of course, uh, uh, the homeowners loan corporation uh, uh, mapped uh, American cities uh, based on the percentage of black folks living along streets, based on street surveys, and with uh, uh, the banks uh, delineated zones that determine their eligibility uh, to get investment. So if you're in a green or a blue zone, uh, you were doing pretty good. If you're in a yellow, tough, red, no, you know, no loans, no federal support. Uh, in Durham, uh, there was an interesting study done by Duke uh, University faculty uh, mapping tree canopy cover in Durham to redlining, which is to say uh, Durham, uh, a lot of the trees that uh, really delineate some of its great neighborhoods, some of its most beautiful ones, uh, the great mighty oaks were planted in the 1920s and the 1930s during this period. And the redlined areas of Durham were the ones that had the lowest level of tree canopy. And so it seems like a small thing in terms of uh, investment, but it's an indicator of all the things, no loans to buy homes, to improve businesses, to improve infrastructure, to build wealth, uh, are things that were uh, federally uh, funded and regulated. And before we even get uh, much further, we get to urban renewal. And this, for many of you, uh, is familiar. These are before and after pictures around the Haytai Heritage Center in Durham and the Durham Freeway and shows the characteristics of Haytai, one of the great uh, Black communities of North Carolina, uh, as well as uh, Durham, uh, tied to uh, Black Wall Street, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, and NC Central University, and a lot of these major institutions, you can see it's literally been turned backwards and upside down uh, through federally funded mandates uh, that resulted in uh, the destruction of housing stock, social networks, and connections, and even to this day is still uh, struggling to build economic and social activity, largely due to the infrastructure that we targeted there. In a lot of cases, this results in lasting consequences that impact the ability for certain communities to participate in the built environment. Because a lot of that takes investment. Uh, and some of that is devaluation of homes. So what's interesting is this is a national study that was done by Brookings in 2018. I'm sure it's different now uh, in the wake of COVID and a lot of our challenges. But uh, what it's indicating are that uh, homes owned by black folks uh, compared to homes owned by white folks of the same quality, character, design, and context uh, were devalued uh, almost 11% in Raleigh alone, which isn't the largest devaluation. There's some that are much higher that are in Virginia and other places uh, simply because of the occupants. And it's one of those things where it's not documented, it's not uh, verified in terms of specific decisions, but it's a, it's a trend in terms of saying same home, same context, one black neighborhood, one white neighborhood, black neighborhood devalued. Uh, and that has lasting impact. Because uh, home ownership is one of the major contributors to household wealth. And the wealth disparity in US households is alarming. Uh, 
uh, particularly on racial lines. So uh, it's essentially 100 to 1. Uh, average household wealth in the U.S. for black families is just over $1,000 uh, as opposed to uh, uh, almost $120,000 for white families. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with disparities uh, and disruptions in the ability to build wealth in homes and stay in place and has even far further reaching uh, impacts. Uh, so Raj Chetty's great work uh, dealing with uh, social mobility and upward mobility across the country identifies in red that same black belt area as the lowest upward mobility in the country, which is to say that people who are in the lowest percentile of poverty in those areas have the lowest chance of ever getting out of that situation. And cities like Charlotte and Atlanta and Houston, which we celebrate for huge economic growth, uh, huge booming economies, at least before COVID, uh, are actually the worst places for African-Americans who are low income to live if they wanna get out of poverty. So all of these are components that are connected by the built environment. Uh, to take a bit of a detour, I've spent a part of my life dealing with uh, hurricane disaster recovery and relief, and we've spent a lot of time in eastern North Carolina. As a part of that research, we started to learn from other areas, and this comes from research after Superstorm Sandy uh, hit New York and New Jersey, and they were trying to make uh, predictions about uh, which communities would bounce back the fastest after their physical infrastructure was devastated. Uh, and it turned out that the places where people knew their neighbors, where they knew cell phones, they knew each other's kids, uh, a lot of the social factors that we don't really measure in the built environmental world, and we definitely don't celebrate uh, as a part of our work, were the biggest indicators of recovery. So this idea of social cohesion made up of three parts. Uh, one, social mobility, which we talked about extremely low where we are. Uh, one, social capital, like the level of trust that they have in one another, uh, measures of civic participation, you know, there are other ways of measuring social capital. And social exclusion, uh, whether or not people feel included in a part of society from a living standard standpoint. Those three components uh, contribute to social cohesion. So high social cohesion, people are generally more resilient and will bounce back. Low social cohesion, it's difficult. And so how can what we talk about today uh, relate to uh, reinforcing people's sense of social cohesion? And what I like to offer is the idea of building social cohesion as an equitable heritage strategy. So we spend a lot of time on the financial sides, obviously so, of what we do, the economic capital. Uh, we spend a lot of time, at least we do, in the physical environment, the physical design. Uh, do we do enough and value enough the contributions that we make to ideas of social cohesion as we start to talk about uh, heritage and moving forward. Uh, and I'd like to get into a few examples uh, based on work. And the first one is in the South Park neighborhood in Raleigh and um, the Heritage Walk, which is something that was generated through collaboration with the South Park East Raleigh Neighborhood Association. Uh, for people who don't know, uh, Raleigh, uh, state capital, that orange boundary is how uh, South Park East Raleigh defined itself through our process. It's essentially between the high point uh, where the state capital is and Walnut Creek, uh, founded on Freedman's land and the home of important institutions like Shaw University, uh, as well as uh, Chavis Park, which we'll talk about uh, briefly. Uh, Chavis Park started as a Negro park, uh, was funded through the federal government, wasn't funded through state or local uh, components. Uh, of course, Stanford Pullen, uh, the great uh, uh, newspaper uh, icon uh, donated uh, his personal money for Raleigh's first official park, Pullen Park, uh, with amusements, but it was whites only, right? So uh, nearby in South Park, which was designed as an African-American streetcar suburb, uh, uh, the federal government jumped in and proposed the Negro Park. Now, what's interesting about it is it also represents one of the first mixed-use planned uh, communities uh, in Raleigh. So with a school, uh, with a center, with public housing, uh, with a park, and with other facilities. But it was designed as a park as an amusement uh, for African Americans in the segregated Jim Crow era. So duplication of the exact same services and issues. Uh, and the lower part, which I won't have time to get into a lot of detail on, of that image, the bottom middle is a carousel. 
and if you imagine the Pullen uh, carousel, there's a similar one at Chavez, but at the Chavez Park one uh, was under a tent initially, uh, and then uh, built in a rustic kind of structure. And right next to it was an Olympic sized swimming pool, which was a popular attraction for African Americans traveling between Washington, DC and Atlanta. Uh, there's even some stories about how uh, some black folks like Billy Eckstein and others didn't feel safe stopping uh, between those major urban centers until they got to Raleigh, until they got to Southeast Raleigh, in particular Chavis Park. So uh, not just a local amenity, but a regional one. Uh, many of these stories uh, weren't really well documented or well told. Uh, and so this illustrates a workshop that we led uh, using cell phones to help local residents. Those are two local residents in that picture. Uh, learn how to uh, create self-authored digital videos, uh, telling stories about the places that had meaning to them. And because these devices had GPS tracking, uh, there could be a pin in those places where they told the stories. And so a group of particularly of African-American ladies uh, produced about 50 videos um, that all uh, recounted the life of the park and the neighborhood uh, in ways that had not been revealed or discussed previously. Uh, that's a sample of one of the maps, uh, all free on Google. You click a pin and you hear a story and you hear what people are talking about. Well, this uh, revealed, you know, some of the more important uh, factors. I think at the time, the conversation was about the park being a local amenity. But when you start to discover, well, you know, that whole Jim Crow South geography between Washington and Atlanta, uh, but also organizations like this. So the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you know, which was founded at Shaw University, but what we discovered through some of the stories is that uh, Chavis Park, this is a picture from Mississippi, but reflects one of the, the trainings uh, that they used to use in the park to prepare people for uh, nonviolent direct action at that time. So how to handle hecklers and people who would abuse you and physically uh, harm you, how to stay focused and work. That work started in the park before it got to the university. Didn't know that until we started talking to people, and really connecting to that broader narrative of social cohesion. And uh, its role, you know, uh, that as the city uh, desegregated uh, and Pullum Park was seen as more of the important regional park that was, of course, open to all people, right, was not segregated anymore, uh, that resources were diverted there uh, to make Pullum stronger and Chavis uh, over the same period of time was uh, d divested from. So rather than duplication of services so close by, uh, they encouraged people who used to rely on amusements at Chavis to go to Pullen. Uh, but that triggered a lot of that history and that memory, uh, uh, mostly sparked by the relocation of the carousel, uh, which led people uh, into uh, major uh, resistance. Uh, so as a part of the Heritage Walt work, uh, we recounted the stories. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, a framework plan that would allow those stories to uh, frame a self-guided walking tour through the community and along that tour targeted public infrastructure improvements uh, that incorporate uh, the narrative of how these places really work. Chavis Park is one of the beneficiaries of it. So the uh, work uh, of the ladies in the neighborhood uh, contributed to the case uh, that Mary Hanbury made. Uh, she did the historic uh, documentation for Chavis Park to get it on the National Register of Historic Places, which it is today. Uh, as well as uh, leveraging uh, a bond issue for renovations, a $12.5 million bond issue. Uh, Chavis Park now is being renovated uh, with a new center and a new landscape that will incorporate uh, some of that work. And the work goes on. Uh, but this idea that this grew up from uh, a community-led issue, uh, that there was a way of handling the conflict when people resisted a certain kind of change, that the process revealed uh, stories and narratives that up to that point weren't well known or distributed and that they were empowered. Those were empowered stories. The storytellers were empowered uh, to the point where resources uh, were allocated to begin to uh, realize their vision uh, is one example. Uh, the next one is Princeville, uh, which I'll call Greater Princeville, uh, which we'll talk about why in a second. Uh, and is in the, uh, really the shadow of a, re a real challenge with a lot of uh, communities, uh, black communities in particular, but rural and small towns uh, generally, because a lot of them were built in harm's way. Uh, 
Princeville in particular, uh, called Freedom Hill, ironically, uh, was founded in a swamp. And it was founded in a swamp on the Tar River uh, because uh, at the, when the Union Army uh, came through North Carolina, uh, when they started to uh, defeat Confederate forces and move through the state, uh, African Americans who were now uh, freed uh, started following you know, these soldiers and setting up camp uh, nearby. Uh, where they were stationed and Freedom Hill had one of those origins. Now, after the end of the Civil War, this was the land uh, that African Americans were allowed to buy, the least desirable land in the floodplain. And so literally raising it up into a hill, Freedom Hill in 1865, uh, which predates Eatonville, Florida, and predates Mound Bayou, Mississippi. It's the, the oldest uh, free charter town. It's only an hour away from where we are. Uh, has faced uh, dramatic uh, 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 consequences due to climate change, sea level rise, and increased hurricane activity. Uh, so this is the cover of an article from the Cultural Landscape Foundation that we all co-authored, uh, sort of raising notice that they're not just uh, Freedom Hill or Princeville, but many communities are in harm's way. As with a lot of rural communities east of uh, uh, our area, uh, Eastern North Carolina, the legacy of plantations, the legacy of uh, low wealth uh, 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 still informs uh, how a lot of things work, but it's also one of the places where a lot of political action occurred. And so we try to think of these small towns uh, in larger units as regions uh, and really try and celebrate elements that are beyond the boundaries of the towns. So uh, the African American Music Trails Project led by the NC African American Heritage Commission, you know, moves through Princeville, Freedom Road trail sites, um, a number of other, it was the Black Second, the historic congressional district that gave birth to some of the, the great black uh, 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 political leaders uh, in our state's history. Uh, all are within the boundary of this. Uh, so it's important also to acknowledge different scales, but you know, generally for people who are unfamiliar with Princeville, it's on the other side of the river uh, from Tarboro, uh, which of course has its you know rich uh, history and legacy going back to Revolutionary War, uh, but along the Tar River regarding Black folks, it's really Shiloh Landing, uh, which is on the outskirts of town, which is in the upper right of this slide, uh, which in tar for the Tar River was the last navigable point for boats coming from Virginia bringing enslaved African people, and so it was a stop-off point where those people were disembarked. They would walk along that walk, that green line, uh, across the river uh, to what is now town, town Common Park, but was the slave selling block. That was the place where African Americans were sold. And so that part of the story was really important uh, as we started to learn more uh, about Princeville in addition to its uh, 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 challenges uh, dealing with flood. Uh, what a lot of people don't talk about in Princeville are uh, the memories that people have. So between uh, redevelopment projects and uh, flood damage, there's very little built infrastructure in Princeville that will let you know uh, why it mattered or why it was important, uh, which is a shame. Um, but there's, uh, there are some elements when you talk to people in Princeville, that center picture is, uh, is, is the mayor and the mayor pro tem and a lot of the people we work with. Uh, these are the images that they recall. They recall businesses. So, you know, the Orange James grocery store, Turner Prince's house, the namesake of uh, Princeville, uh, a carpenter uh, who was well-respected in the community, and on and on and on. So sometimes when we go to places, we don't see the physical trace evidence that validates why people think it matters. And in the case of Princeville, I'll get on the soapbox for just a second and say that uh, it's been very, Princeville is not a national historic place despite the fact that it's the first black free town in America. And it's because of a barrier in terms of the integrity of the town and its infrastructure, which is to say it doesn't have enough uh, historic structures of equality uh, to meet uh, the requirements uh, to proceed. And I think it's worth revisiting uh, those assumptions uh, to say that there might be other ways to tell a compelling story that would enable Princeville to take advantage of the benefits that it would receive uh, from a tourism standpoint as well as economic development standpoint for a national uh, registered place. We, uh, and many of you know, that we often spend a lot of our time with the keepers of history, 
uh, which are gray-haired people like me, uh, but we're often trying to find ways to excite the next generation, you know, about the heritage and the culture of their places. And so these are kids from a summer camp called Enviro Kids. Uh, they're all middle school and high school kids from the Raleigh area. And even though they were an hour away, they had never heard of Princeville. Uh, and so uh, the lady in the black shirt in this picture uh, is a Princeville resident who was like, look, we can just give a tour. And so what we're looking at now is the Tar River, that's Shiloh Landing. And that was the beginning of the tour. So the people in Princeville kind of decided how they wanted to tell their story and their heritage. And even though I have two teenagers at home and they're knuckleheads, uh, you know, they won't sit still for anything. Uh, they were completely captivated and entranced uh, by this story, uh, even without infrastructure to kind of support it. Uh, and so it, it really led to uh, a walking tour of some of the historic elements. This is the old Rosenwald School that I mentioned earlier that had been since converted to a museum and a welcome center uh, that was still water damaged at the time. And so surprising to us, uh, all the kids wanted to go inside immediately and get the story. And when they got inside and saw that it was all, you know, floorboards and, you know, uh, construction and things, they got really disappointed. And we kind of filed that away and said, hey, maybe this is also an opportunity for another generation to get excited about Princeville. So uh, we had a serendipitous conversation with the uh, head of the School of Architecture at NC State, uh, David Hill, uh, and said, hey, we just did this thing with these high school kids walking through Princeville. They were all really mad. There's no museum. We wish there was something like we could pop up there uh, that was fitted out, air conditioned, had electricity, but was sort of a gallery space. Uh, that could be almost a substitute until they got the resources uh, to build a permanent museum. And so David kind of uh, nodded his head and then came back later and said, hey, we got a donor. We have a design build studio. Let's do a mobile museum. And we all said, great. Uh, and so uh, Ellen Cassidy and uh, uh, Randy Leno and a couple of other folks uh, in 16 weeks led students through the design and the fabrication and the construction of this uh, mobile museum, uh, which functions as a billboard uh, for Princeville. You could hook it up to the back of a truck. You could bring it to the legislature. You could bring it to Washington, D.C. or anywhere, pop it open. Uh, there's room inside for exhibits. Uh, one of the early exhibits were pho photography, uh, uh, photo documentation project uh, immediately following uh, Hurricane Matthew, really celebrating the people and the culture of Princeville. This is Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Linda Joyner, poison, posing in front of her own picture. Uh, and, you know, we're really excited about the potential of that and led to other initiatives. So, uh, you know, uh, blitz uh, cleanups uh, across town, including uh, some beautification at the Princeville Town Hall as it's still being renovated. So those catalytic activities that bring people together are important. And Princeville had never had a homecoming. Uh, uh, they lost uh, most of their uh, uh, property and residents uh, following Hurricane Floyd decades ago, uh, but they never had any activities to kind of bring everybody back. So uh, COVID unfortunately uh, uh, put a, uh, a, a blanket on this particular project, but it shows the level of agency that people now have to get excited about telling their story. And uh, we hope that we can gather next August uh, to celebrate the legacy of Princeville. I'm going to close with uh, some thoughts about measures and capitals, which I've mentioned before. Um, um, the economic capital issue is really important. Uh, that's what helps the built environment go. Uh, but there are other capitals uh, that are that could reward uh, a broader view of these landscapes where great heritage occurred. Uh, one that we're looking at closely is uh, from the Reimagining the Civic Commons project, which comes from the Knight Foundation, which comes from the JPB uh, Foundation, but a philanthropic entity that's really looking at uh, alternative ways of measuring the benefits of places that bring people together. Uh, they have some really interesting categories that we usually don't talk about in our work. So uh, how does the work, uh, whether it's you know, preserving and restoring a structure or interpreting the heritage of a public space, you know, how does that support civic engagement? How does that help people feel more of a sense of agency uh, and power uh, in public life? Uh, how do they promote socioeconomic mixing, right? So code word for 
people with different incomes and coming from different backgrounds that are using the places once they've been transformed. Uh, how do they promote environmental sustainability? It's natural, I'm a tree hugger, but the idea of uh, proposing uh, ways of dealing with uh, ways of moving outside of the car, uh, uh, walking, biking, a lot of the activities that we know are compatible uh, with our piece. And how does it work with value creation? And this is important in terms of these investments fostering local businesses, not global brands, uh, not global capital, but local capital. Uh, and how does it uh, increase the perception of safety uh, while still maintaining affordability? So these are really important questions. They have uh, several pilot cities around the country. Uh, Charlotte, I believe, is one because they're connected with the Knight Foundation as well as my hometown of Detroit. Uh, but it, it, it brings a different uh, metric uh, to the table. Uh, and the last one I wanted to talk about was something I learned about in New Orleans. Uh, one of my friends is uh, Brian Lee, uh, who leads Colocate and is leader of the design justice movement, uh, who really has taken uh, uh, the stage uh, during the uh, rebellions uh, following the George Floyd murder, murder. He has an incredible article in the Washington Post about public spaces that is recommended for everybody. But he introduced us to uh, the Gulf Coast Housing Partnership uh, which essentially is supported by a bank. And when you talk to the bank underwriters, they say, well, we really don't have a social mission or ethic. You know, we just want return. But since they know they don't have that social mission or ethic, they know how to team up with people who do and who know how to spin that into return. And so one of the projects that we really like about it uh, that's now built, these are renderings uh, that were generated to... Uh, help promote it, but it's now there, is the Aretha or or Castle Haley Boulevard uh, Memorial Project. So the neutral grounds in New Orleans are really important to cultural heritage. People would meet in what we would call the medians or the boulevards uh, and, uh, and, and handle their day-to-day their -day business. So this project restores uh, one of the lost neutral grounds and then also uh, accents it with celebrating one of the most important civil rights leaders uh, in New Orleans history as the anchor uh, important cultural institutions. So uh, the bank was able to no negotiate uh, rents and rates uh, to attract a number of entrepreneurs to come in. This is a cultural arts organization uh, that occupies this one. Um, this is a bike repair project, a youth empowerment project that uh, works with local people, local kids in particular, uh, trains them to deal with uh, restoring, repairing uh, and maintaining bikes. Uh, in trade for uh, the living wage and or accommodation in affordable housing. It's a really incredible program that occupied some of this uh, boulevard uh, to activate it, particularly post-Katrina. But the big one is how they measured some of the impacts. And this is something that uh, we're looking at now as well. Uh, property tax implications. They know that property taxes make city coffers go, and so generating property tax revenue is important. Uh, and so helping people understand where that property tax money goes. So 30% to improving schools, you know, 16% back to the city uh, and on and on and on. So that's helpful. Uh, how they've leveraged facade renew grants. So showing people where that economic activity has resulted in over $10 million of additional investment, leveraging just under 800,000 in grants. Uh, home values increasing 26%, which is 22% higher than the rest of the city. Uh, home loans, uh, so 55% increase in home loans made for people. And then the clincher, there are a number of stats. They track voting, so they talk to people and said, how does this impact voting and your level of civic engagement, population growth, purchasing power, police calls went down 27%. Uh, when things went on, but the, the key stat is that no one was displaced due to increased property values. Everybody that was there when they started is still there, despite all this economic activity. So the ability to uh, begin to measure and expand uh, the impacts of what we do to the broader project of social cohesion uh, is needed. We have some great role models uh, to learn from uh, and will help uh, to prosecute the case. So with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, and uh, I think that leaves us 10 minutes. Thank you.
Just trying to unmute myself there. I think, are you still, I think you're uh, still sharing there. Ah, there we go. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was excellent um, presentation. So we'll, um, yeah, claps from here. Um, so we do have a question. So I'll go ahead and, and start there. And again, folks, you can um, raise your hand. I think somebody raised a hand and, um, also in the chat and then in the Q&A section. So I'll just start with our Q&A questions. Um, so this is from Marie Cochran. Uh, who was the photographer of the projected image of George Floyd on Ro the Robert E. Lee Monument in Richmond? Uh, that's a great question. I actually have that information, but uh, I don't have it handy, so I can email it um, after the session. I'd be happy to share that. Well, um, Mayor, if you want to put an email address or something in the chat, then I'll I'll get that for you. Um, let's see. And then uh, from Denise, uh, lots of great information. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned many resources. Could you provide those? If you want, Kofi, if you want to just send some stuff to me and then I can um, send it out to the attendees. I have everybody registered. I have your email address. So I'll just send something out that way. I can do that. No problem. Okay. Um, from Nikki Lack, um, I'm interested in the Black refugee camps of the Civil War for freed people and former slaves in North Carolina especially the camp established in uh, Beaufort, NC in 1862, which provided shelter for over 3,000 people in 1865. Do you have any ideas of where I could find more information on this camp? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission uh, has uh, uh, a lot of uh, archival information that I know went into their uh, Freedom Roads Project and other ones. So I would start there. So that's through the Arts Council, NC Arts Council. So the NC uh, African American Heritage Commission, which I think is directed by Angela Thorpe right now. Uh, that'd be the person I would contact. All right, I think that's it. I thought I had some raise. Okay, here we go. Um, this is from Nicole um, Brannon. Curious, what what are your thoughts on how we deal with places like Princeville, where our existing systems say it's not significant when we know it is? Do you think we should basically redo the National Register criteria or other local criteria? Well, I like that she thinks big. It would be great to redo the criteria. <laughs> but I think that there are cases uh, where um, uh, uh, people were inclusive with the criteria for designation. Um, I do think that uh, hinging everything on the um, integrity criteria of remaining structures uh, was a great idea, but uh, when you look at the map of uh, what we're anticipating in terms of climate change and sea level rise and increased hurricane activity and the risk that particularly some of these small, re low resource communities, small towns, rural areas will face. Um, I don't think that it's one size fits all, but I think that uh, uh, the idea that we may need to revisit some of those criteria, uh, acknowledging that uh, storms and other unforeseen events uh, removed a lot of that infrastructure, but the memory is still there, uh, that the voices are authentic, that there are other stories to be told uh, is probably a good way to go. So I would I would say revisiting that integrity uh, uh, category in the context of what we're anticipating in terms of climate change, which is everything on the East Coast being at constant risk of uh, of destruction. Uh, we need to find other ways to to kind of codify and celebrate that history. All right, thank you. There, I'm going to jump around a minute. We had a Another Princeville question since we were talking about that. I'm from Bill Holman. I appreciate your comments on Princeville and the barrier 
to designating it as a national register? Are the barriers state or national or both? Um, thanks for the question, Bill. Actually, I know Bill, so hey, Bill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we ran into that uh, barrier talking with the State Historic Preservation Office um, that there was uh, uh, the integrity bar uh, was not met. So uh, that's, that's the nature of that conversation. We didn't proceed to federal, but we did have initial conversations with the, the State Historic Preservation Office, and that was the feedback we got. Um, we've got a pet question from Melanie Graham. Um, where would you start the placekeeping retention work and discussion in a blighted black neighborhood with residential buildings? Uh, that's a great question, Melanie. Um, uh, uh, my friends who are in that world, uh, their first point of attack is blight uh, and slum um, and changing our vocabulary. Uh, to acknowledge that some structures uh, may be ruined or may be in different states of repair, but that uh, blight removal and slum clearance are tied to uh, some very destructive uh, processes that, that did a lot of damage to black communities. And so uh, part of it is sort of how we talk about it, but the other side is uh, what I enjoyed about uh, the work with the Gulf Coast uh, folks in New Orleans was uh, they found ways to sort of uh, resource and incentivize and actually provide resources to local people uh, to innovate in how to do that. So sometimes uh, the ways that we all know how to do things uh, don't match reality on the ground or, uh, you know, don't have the capacity or uh, the time frame is out of whack with what we have to do and, and, and local creative people can be really ingenious if they're empowered and they're supported. So I think part of that is, you know, in communities where you're considering it is to uh, see what partnerships uh, could be formed uh, that could provide some incentive and some resource for local people to innovate, you know, in terms of how to deal with it. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Laura Benson. Given the length of time it takes to build trust in communities as part of the important social engagement component of social cohesion, what have you learned are the most effective ways of doing that in the course of town planning timelines? One example that I'm following is Cedar, uh, Cedar Street Park in Beaufort. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, it's time. Um, I think that one of the challenges, uh, at least with the built environmental professions, is that a lot of us are fee for service, and uh, you know we get money, we are work to a scope. You know uh, the time and the level of depth that we can get into with communities are restricted by you know those kinds of things. Uh, but what we found is uh, that. Uh, can sometimes leave a bad taste in communities' mouths in terms of coming in, uh, sort of making rapid decisions, not well thought out about how to proceed with a very complicated problem, uh, and then leaving, right? And so we get the benefit of a fee or, uh, you know, a project for a portfolio or that kind of thing, and the community is still left with some of the issues that they had before we got there. And so uh, the biggest factor I found is finding ways to uh, get more time and more authentic engagement. And in some ways, building relationships outside of the scope of the actual project, sometimes it also forces us to direct too quickly to the practical matters of, 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 of bricks and mortar, getting things done. Sometimes it's basic stuff like, you know, having dinner together, doing walks together, you know, learning how to, you know, not everyone knows how to argue or disagree in a civil way. So, you know, there's just some basic human uh, work that comes with the benefit of time. And if there are other resources, uh, philanthropic others that can start to add resources to enable longer periods of time uh, with folks, then uh, that, that, that tends to uh, uh, create the potential for more authentic engagement. So I, I would say finding ways to, to get more time uh, with people to work through issues. Well, thank you. We've got Two more questions and one more comment, so I'll get through those. Um, so from Lucy Grist, 
what is the best way and or how can we get involved in the Rosenwald schools? Do folks just need money or are there opportunities um, to be hands on? Um, yeah, there's a, there, there is a pretty active Rosenwald uh, preservation group around the country. Um, there are at least two in North Carolina that I know that have been restored and rehabilitated. One is uh, the W.B. Du Bois School uh, in... Um, is it Wake Forest? In Wake Forest, thank you. Yeah. I, I was blanking on it, yeah. But that, that one was restored through this particular program. There's another one that I read about uh, several years ago. So there is an active group in North Carolina. Um, I don't have the specific name of that group at the top of my tongue, but but, but those places exist. And yes, I do think that it, it is just a matter of dollars. People you know, apply for grants, you know, they, they, they get in-kind services, they do pro bono work, uh, and that's how that works out, so, yeah. Um, Patrick, we, now, because my, this is one of our former board members is pretty, was pretty active with Rosenwald School stuff, so, Patrick, if you want to um, email me, I can send you some stuff about that. Um, and let's see, uh, Let's see, we've got another question from Marie. Uh, Marie Cochran, I'm a visual artist who often um, performative conceptual work to claim black spaces. I also found the um, Africa, Afro, like chicken, I'm sorry, Marie, I'm trying to pronounce that. Um, Africa Lachin Artist Project, which looks beyond state lines to acknowledge our presence in the region. Do you know of other initiatives that are not state bound? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I've heard of Appalachia, so, um, it's not, so I think I just read an article about that work, so uh, salute you. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I know that there's one about the Geechee Gullah Corridor that uh, I think goes across South Carolina and Georgia with the Sea Islands. Um, that's a multi-state kind of regional uh, strategy um, and I think that there's a blues trail project that goes through Mississippi and Alabama and another, a couple of other states that are tied to music heritage. Uh, those are two that come to mind, but, uh, but I'll, I'll keep looking. That's a, that's a really good question. Awesome. And then um, from an anonymous uh, attendee, what are some ways to work? Uh, what are some ways to work uh, to revitalize communities without falling into the gentrification trap? Mm. That's a hard question. Um, I'll bring up time again. Um, there are a few experiments going on now. Um, yeah, the issue is global capital uh, and that uh, there's lots of incentives uh, for people to uh, invest globally and particularly before COVID at least, uh, center cities were getting a lot of a lot of investment and the opportunity zone program uh that this administration put forward put that in overdrive in some cases uh by by treating them as economic commodities for investors right um and just conceptually the big one is to try and get as much local control as possible which means getting ahead of the curve so uh, by the time we see you know condos and apartment buildings popping out of vacant lots and in our neighborhoods, uh, that was three years ago when those decisions got made, you know, and uh, the money that they're using for it isn't the money of those developers. They are um, uh, uh, borrowing, you know, from other entities and their number one metric is return on investment. And so, and no part of that process is any consideration with community other than reducing conflict, right? So you end up getting into community benefits agreements and a lot of other things, which, you know, sometimes don't pan out. So the one that we're watching is the uh, uh, 11th Street Bridge Equitable Development Plan in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is a decommissioned bridge connecting Anacostia uh, to Southwest D.C. federal area that's going to be turned into a park. And they knew that that investment was going to trigger a private market response, like who doesn't want to be along a bridge as a park in the United States to be the first one of this kind. So uh, they enacted a 10-year equitable development plan, 10 years before construction of this thing or the opening of it. 
uh, to try and build community capacity to be prepared for it. So not to guarantee that people don't get displaced, but to put them in the best position to deal with it. And so uh, LISC uh, led the effort, but there's a huge set of partners and um, they've done a lot of really smart things uh, to uh, really, again, make the community as strong as possible and res local residents as strong as possible to be able to withstand what's coming. Uh, there really isn't a strategy I've been able to find that can prevent it other than a land trust. Uh, and that's a whole nother conversation uh, dealing with land trusts. But generally speaking with gentrification, it's timing. You got to get ahead of it and you got to get a broad coalition of partners pushing uh, before uh, development occurs. We just have two more comments and I'll end, I'll end with those. The first is from Bill Holman. Great presentation. Thanks for your work. And the last one is, I appreciate the use of, um, from Patrick Page, I appreciate the use of Diego Rivera as Kofi's background. So I, I knew you would appreciate right. hearing that also. Um, so yeah, it, Adam Mike, I don't know if you have any other comments or anything, um, but I wanna thank Professor Boone again and thank our um, sponsors, um, Blue Heron, um, for sponsoring this uh, event. And we will have, our next event is on the 25th of August, I believe, um, on a Tuesday at four, um, we'll be doing Lost Wilmington at the beach, um, being led by our um, director at Bellamy Mansion, uh, Gareth Evans. So that's coming up and we'll be adding more events um, on our website. So be on the lookout um, for that. And um, we're gonna do this little after party. So if there are folks that wanna join us for that, um, I've posted the link in the chat. And also it is in your uh, reminder email. So uh, folks are registered, you should have gotten an email um, a week ahead of time, a day ahead of time, and the hour before, and the link is also available there, but I posted in the chat um, as well. All right, y'all. I'll see you on the other side. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Bye.